Food. It's something everyone from all around the world, since the beginning of time, needs to survive. Changes in food production and consumption change over time in every culture, often because of some historical event. Today, when we think of Irish food, we think of potatoes. In England, we think of tea. Has it always been that way? Stereotypical food for Ireland, Germany, England, West Africa, and Native America have gone through changes, and there are a few changes that might shock you. When thinking of England, you often think of a lazy afternoon with British royalty gathered around sweet scones and elegant cups full of hot tea, but tea wasn't always a part of the British diet. If that's what you're thinking, wrong. Tea slowly made its way into England around 1610, but it wasn't capitalized on until the mid-18th century when the British East India Company flooded its ports. Before this warm pastime beverage found its way there, English citizens often drank ale, such as perry, a pear ale or beer. Water was seen as contaminated and milk was used for dairy purposes, so neither of them were typically consumed. And speaking of dairy, a typical family owned around 30 dairy cows and used their products to sell. Alongside the dairy cows, you often saw sheep, whose lamb meat and mutton were part of the basic protein intake. Chicken, duck, beef, and pork were also part of their diet, and these items were typically from the farm. The famous fox hunts with well-trained foxhounds were typically of royalty only, so the art of hunting was left to the upper class. Welcome to rainy, chilly Ireland in the 1730s. There's nothing like hot, steaming potato soup to chase away the cold, right? Wrong! The major staple of the Irish diet before 1760 was oats. So forget potato soup and pass me some yummy porridge and milk. This corn was used to grind oats into flour. It was the kid's job to grind, and let me tell you, this chore took a long time, about 45 minutes to grind one cup. So the kids would take turns. They also used this corn to churn butter daily. Turning takes two to three hours every day! It wasn't until the 1760s that potatoes started to take over the Irish diet as the primary food source because countries like England, Germany, and America were buying and selling oats and other grains like it was gold. Oats became a cash crop, so the Irish decided oats were more valuable to sell than to eat. They shifted their diet completely to potatoes. They're extremely nutritious! And sold and traded the oats for extra cash. Their reliance on potatoes had negative effects later on when the potato blight hit and wiped out potatoes across the country. Because the Irish climate is so wet and cold, they had to eat their beef quickly before it went rancid. They didn't salt it to save for later, so overall their diet included very little protein. Pigs went to market to be sold for cash, then if they're lucky, the farmers might buy back the hooves and snout. Those fat pigs eat better than we do! Chickens were used mostly for their eggs instead of nuggets. But hey chickens, either you help us out with eggs for breakfast or help us out with chicken dinner, it's your choice. That chicken dinner might include an Irish, fav Irish favorite, cockaliki soup. The Irish didn't drink the water because it was filthy. Everyone, even the kids, drank beer, tea, and buttermilk or sour milk from the dairy cows. They also ate root vegetables like carrots, turnips, parsley, and onions. Germany, land of beer, bratwurst, and the toaster strudel in abundance for all to enjoy, right? Er, in the 1500s, Germans ate an average of 250 pounds of pork per person. That's a lot of pork. But when the price of pork skyrocketed, by the 1700s, each person only had 40 pounds of pork per year. This made pork only readily available to the upperclassmen who could afford it. While these wealthier citizens easily enjoyed their bratwurst of beer, the lower class citizens still enjoyed other dishes that are still part of typical German cuisine. Sauerkraut, for example, was a huge help to those who stored this fermented cabbage over winter. When stocks of food began dwindling down in early spring, sauerkraut was often there to save the day by filling those empty tummies. And nah, flour wasn't used constantly to create those warm gooey toasty strudels, rather it was often taken to the baker or communal village oven to bake bread instead of being prepared from home. Here's a West African family compound that represents life in a free Igbo household in the 1700s in the area of what is now Nigeria. We're in a tropical rainforest. During this time, nearly 250,000 Africans were brought to America as slaves, and 40% of those people came from this area of West Africa. 
Only one family lives on this complex, but we're talking about a big family here. This outdoor kitchen would be used during the dry season to cook staple crops, crops like yams, rice, malil, carava, and fufu. The West African people would eat thick soups with fish, beans, and peppers. Yum! When the dry season ends and rainy season begins, one of the wives would bring in the outdoor kitchen to be used as fire. One of the wives. Yes, in West Africa, it was typical for a husband to have many wives. On this family's complex, there's the husband's house, the first wife's house, which is closest to the husband's front door, and the large wife's house for all the other wives. When the Colombian exchange began after Columbus's voyage to America, the West Africans added corn and tomatoes to their diet. These new menu items became very popular. In this garden, you can see the beginnings of banana trees. This family would also probably grow black-eyed peas, okra, acara, which are a lot like hush puppies, and corn for corn mash. Here we are in an eastern woodland community. The eastern woodland Indians lived in this area, expanding from the Atlantic Ocean all the way to the Mississippi River. Here's the communal kitchen of an eastern woodland tribe. You can see bear fat in the pot, which would be strained with a cheesecloth, then used in grease lamps or for pigments. The communal kitchen is in the center of the village because people would eat whenever they were hungry. Imagine that, never having to wait for dinner. It's just always waiting for you, hot and ready, right in the center of town. There was no set meal time because everyone in the tribe was so busy and divided in labor. Native Americans ate a lot of corn, squash, and beans. They traded these foods through all of Mesoamerica. Most of their food came from farming, such as the corn, beans, and squash. Then they added in extras from hunting and gathering. Women knew 1,200 to 1,500 different plants. You'd probably think that the Native Americans loved all the cool things the colonists brought with them from Europe, including food, right? Ah. The Indians hated the onions brought by the Europeans. They made me cry! Why would I eat them? But oh boy, they loved peaches and melons from Europe. The Europeans brought metal pots too, but the Native Americans preferred their clay pots. Did you know water boils much faster in clay pots? They're also easier to make. The Eastern Woodland Indians would trade the colonists for copper pots, then cut them up to make jewelry. Since what the Eastern Woodland Indians already had going on was going on perfectly, they had no motivation to change their lifestyle the way the European visitors wanted them to. These diverse cultures have different adaptations to their diet based on historical events, interactions with other countries, and their environments. These diverse historical communities of West Africa, England, Ireland, Germany, and the Eastern Woodlands affect the communities of today and tomorrow.